The Clown Prince of Crime is an iconic character from the DC Universe, and debatably the most popular supervillain from the comic book world. He's been played by a legion of different actors across multiple universes, and though he will never disappear from media, he does still die. And I mean a lot. I've already done three videos on the Joker's deaths, but they just keep killing him, in more amazing and more violent ways. Batman Under the Red Hood, Anniversary Edition. In the Anniversary Edition of the Red Hood film, the audience can choose how the movie plays out. It's a multi-path movie with your choices changing the story. Now, we start with Joker abducting Jason Todd and beating him with a crowbar, just like in the original film. But as Batman races to save Jason before the bomb in the warehouse explodes, you can choose who lives and who dies. And if you choose for Jason to live, then Batman will die. And then the Bat family will bury Bruce Wayne and mourn him, especially Jason Todd, who sinks into a very dark depression and becomes obsessed with finding the Joker, who has seemingly disappeared from the world. Because without Batman, the Joker no longer cares about being the Joker. In fact, he's even hidden his green hair and covered up his bleached skin with makeup and basically become a boring average citizen. But of course, Jason still finds him at the diner where he goes to drink coffee. And halfway through having a conversation with him, Jason grabs the dinner knife and stabs the Joker deep in the eye with it, killing him. <laughs> It's actually a pretty badass John Wick-like moment. Though sadly, two cops arrive to arrest Jason, at which point you can choose to escape and become a vigilante, or you can surrender and go to prison to spend the rest of your life behind bars beating up criminal scum. Now, personally, I think Jason deserves to escape. After all, the Joker does need to be killed, and not even for his crimes. After all, the Joker is insane and therefore not actually responsible for his actions. But at the same time, he causes way too much damage to be allowed to continue living. He is a disease on the world, and he needs to be eradicated for the good of the human race. And even though Joker becomes normal, it won't last. After all, he's become normal several times before, and it never lasts. He always goes back to being the Joker. And while I must admit I don't agree with murder, the Joker does need to be removed once and for all. Although for a list of ways to get rid of the Joker without killing him, check out the links in this video's description. Batman Under the Red Hood Anniversary Edition, again. As I said, this is a multi-path movie with lots of different endings, and the Joker does actually die in one other way. In this version, Batman dies in the explosion, and Jason decides to get justice in his honour, and he brings down Batman's entire rogues gallery, culminating with a showdown on the Gotham Bridge with the Joker. The two fight one another in what I would say personally is quite possibly the best Joker fight ever, and it is definitely the best one that he has ever had with Jason Todd, at least so far in media. And of course, it ends with Jason as the victor, standing over the Joker, holding a gun. But Jason isn't going to kill him. You see, Batman's dying request was for him not to kill, and Jason has stuck to that religiously. Or so he fought. As Jason talks to the Joker, he realises that he's actually had a psychotic break, and though Jason thought he was bringing criminals to justice, he was actually murdering the whole of Batman's rose gallery. Now, in his defense, he did go insane and didn't know he was insane. But of course, Jason now does know, and he has a choice. He can either let the Joker live and go get help from the Bat family, or shoot the Joker in the head and keep being a murdering vigilante. Now, the audience can of course choose, but let's be honest, who didn't choose putting a bullet in the Joker's head? <laughs> <laughs> and this means that Jason is then hunted by both the GCPD and the Bat family. And I think that this is not so much because he killed the Joker, I mean, to be honest, I doubt they really care, but rather it's to stop Jason from killing anyone else. After all, once he's finished with all the big villains, you know, Two-Face, the Mad Hatter, etc., who's he going to go after next? People who are jaywalking? People who are littering? I mean, that's the reason why vigilantes can't be allowed to kill. You never know where they're going to stop. Plus, they don't always get the evidence. They might just kill someone because they've got a hunch. And that's not evidence. That's prejudice. Injustice, the animated film. 
Now, Injustice is a great story, and though the video game is a great watch, the real story is in the comic books. It is very well written and is definitely a must read for any DC fan. And in truth, it deserved its own series, not a movie, as they had to leave a lot of stuff out in the film, but a show could have truly done it justice. That being said, this is still a pretty damn good movie, with a lot of great scenes and a lot of violent deaths. One in particular is of course the death of the Joker, that begins Superman's descent into being a mad dictator. It all starts when the Joker kidnaps Lois Lane, and puts a bomb in her chest. He then uses Scarecrow's fear gas, laced with kryptonite, to make Superman think that Lois Lane is doomsday. So when Superman flies him into space, only to discover that he just killed the love of his life, his wife Lois Lane, whom was also pregnant with his child, well, things seem pretty bleak. But of course, it didn't end there. The detonator in Lois Lane's chest is linked to her heartbeat, and once her heart stops beating, it sets off a nuclear weapon in Metropolis, killing millions. And Superman reacts to this like anyone would. He loses his goddamn mind. And even though the other heroes try to stop him, he easily overpowers them and bursts into the jail cell where the Joker is and punches his fist through the Clown Prince of Crime's chest. It is a bloody scene from a bloody film, and probably the best version of the Injustice Joker death that we've seen so far. After all, we don't really see that much in the video game version, it just kind of fades to black as the Joker is dementedly laughing at his own demise. Maybe you won't kill your next family. Arkham City. In Arkham City, the Joker is dying. This is due to all the chemicals that were in his system in the first game, Arkham Asylum. In this first game, we saw him inject himself with the formula Titan, which is based on Bane's venom and transforms a person into a monstrous Bane-like state. Showtime, Batman! Let's do the room something to talk about! <laughs> Two freaks in a fight to the death! <laughs> These chemicals, combined with the cure to return Joker to normal, leave his blood poisoned and toxic, and he has hours to live as the game starts. Mr. Freeze is making a cure for the poison, but it turns out to be more complicated than simply synthesizing it. Perhaps I should elaborate. Creating an antidote to the disease that afflicts the clown was easy. Unfortunately, the cure degrades too quickly. It needs a restorative element, some kind of reforming enzyme. Without it, it breaks down before it can help its host. I've seen this before. Finding a suitable enzyme is not the only problem. It needs to be adapted, bonded to human DNA. That will take decades. Because of this, the Joker needs Batman to get him the cure, so he injects Batman with the same poison. Batman is fine with this, as he'd rather die than save him, but Joker has a backup plan. Oh, didn't I say? I've spent weeks shipping samples of my blood to emergency rooms all over the city. So Batman has to get the cure by getting Ra's al Ghul's blood and using it to synthesize the cure. Being Batman, he of course does this, but it's not that simple once the cure's synthesized. The formula is complete. The bonding process appears to have been successful. How are you feeling? You look unwell. Give it to me. I'm afraid I cannot do that, Batman. You have given me your last order. But finally, after some pretty good boss fights, Batman gets the cure and drinks enough to save himself, and has enough of it left for the Joker as well. Every decision you've ever made ends with death and misery. People die. I stop you. You'll just break out and do it again. <laughs> Think of it as a running No! Now this death is great because if the Joker hadn't been so vain and had trusted Batman, he would have lived. It's his own nature that leads to his death, and he dies with the laughter of that irony on his lips. Do you want to know something funny? Even after everything you've done, 
I would have saved you. <laughs> that actually is pretty funny. <laughs> The Dark Knight Returns Part 2. This death is amazing simply for its brutality. The movie was based on Frank Miller's The Dark Knight Returns graphic novel and saw Batman do the one thing fans have wanted him to do for years, kill the Joker. After all the years and the things he has done, Batman has finally decided that he needs to take down the Joker once and for all. Are you out of your mind? I'm through playing Joker. It's an incredible fight and truly worthy as an ending to their lifelong feud. And the film is great, but in all honesty, it's worth watching simply for the fight scene between Joker and Batman. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's bad. You should get that look out when you have a chance. After a violent and bloody confrontation through a theme park, the two end up in the Tunnel of Love, which is actually rather a fitting setting for the two since they have a deeper connection with one another than some lovers do. The Joker is badly injured in the fight, and his neck is badly damaged, and he knows that he is lost. But he decides that he has to have the final joke. And rather than let Batman finish it, the Joker breaks his own neck, killing himself and causing the world to believe that Batman was the one who killed him. Which then leads to the famous fight between Superman and Batman. This is just an incredible death. The final fight between the two is something you would think could never live up to our fanboy expectations. But it actually does come pretty close. It's finally here, isn't it? The moment we both dreamed about. In great part because of this ending. It shows how the Joker has no regard for human life, not even his own, and that he's prepared to go to any lengths to win in this feud between him and Batman, not even allowing Batman to have the finishing blow. Plus, that net breaking is just brutal. It's the sound they use with it, and you can actually feel it snap, and it hurts. See you in hell. <laughs> Return of the Joker. Hello, Gotham. Joker's back in town. Return of the Joker was the first true death of the Joker that I ever saw, and I will never forget watching it for the first time. The Joker has kidnapped Tim Drake in an attempt to torture and brainwash him into thinking he is his son, and it works. Say hello, JJ. The Joker invites Batman over to show him what he's done and boast about his destruction of Tim Drake and the birth of Joker Jr. and how he has basically taken yet another Robin from Batman. But as with all things, the Joker takes it too far. He has beaten Batman and he could have ended it there, but he wants Tim Drake to be the one to kill Batman, to show that Batman has truly failed and the Joker has won. But in an incredibly emotional scene, Tim Drake is able to clear his mind enough through the torture and the chemicals that Joker has injected into him, and instead of killing Batman, he kills the Joker. That's not funny. That's not... <laughs> the Joker is once again the architect of his own demise, a common theme and a fitting one for a man like the Joker. And as you watch the Joker die, Tim Drake starts laughing the mad laugh of the Joker, which turns into tears as he is losing his mind, and the full weight of what he has done and what has been done to him hits him. It's the same moment and feeling that Batman had when his parents died, and the same feeling that the Joker had when he'd lost his family and he finally gave in to the madness. But unlike the Joker, Tim Drake is strong enough to eventually get his mind back. We had a trusted friend, Dr. Leslie Tompkins. It took her a year, but she was able to help Tim back to sanity. Still, things were never really the same. But even so, it's a heartbreaking scene to watch and incredibly moving, even in the face of how sadistic this part of the movie really is. One thing I think is important to note with these deaths is that in all of them, Batman is there. He was there when the joke was created, and he was there when the joke ended. And it seems fitting that he should be and they are all the Joker's own fault, the end result and comeuppance for the depraved life he has decided to lead. Batman the Animated Series In this show, the Joker died many, many times. True, we never actually saw his dead body, but he was always falling from places too high for a human to survive. Ah! 
or he'd get eaten by sharks. Or he'd be caught in huge explosions that no one could escape or survive. At this point, he probably is. Now, we as the audience know that he must be dead, but he of course has to reappear in the show later on as he's Batman's arch nemesis. So you either know that he died and came back because the show must go on, or you could think that he somehow miraculously survived these deaths. It's up to a person to decide for themselves, but personally I think he definitely died in all of these times and the showrunners just had to bring it back. But with that being said, these deaths are last on this list because he may have somehow survived. The Red Wedding There is a condition known as Battered Wife Syndrome. It's when a spouse is beaten and abused for so long that they eventually just snap and then they calmly kill the person who's been abusing them. And this is what happens in Harley Quinn's ending in the game Injustice Gods Among Us, when Harley decides that she has finally had enough of the Joker. She traveled to the visitor's earth and freed the Joker from prison. Returning to her world, they married in a ceremony that set Gotham ablaze. At the reception, the cake-cutting ceremony took a gruesome turn. As her new husband playfully mashed her face into the cake, years of abuse took its toll. Something in Harley snapped. She used the ceremonial knife to slash Joker's throat. Still wearing her wedding gown, Harley now resides permanently in Arkham Asylum. Now this is actually one of the best Joker deaths that there's ever been, because it finally shows him getting what he deserves for abusing Harley Quinn. I mean, yes, he has killed and hurt a lot of people, but most of these are just arbitrary strangers who we don't really know anything about. Not all of them, admittedly, some we do, but most of them, we've no idea who they are. However, with Harley Quinn, the reader can really form an emotional connection with her, as we've seen so much of her story, and we've seen her being abused for years. So we can really sympathize with her plight, and the fact that she just can't get away from the Joker, because she doesn't want to as she genuinely thinks she's in love with him. So it's very satisfying to see her finally realize that she deserves better and stand up for herself. And this is actually one of the few times in media that Harley actually gets some justice, or at least some revenge on the Joker. As most of the time, Joker's character has to stay alive and free. After all, he is a cash cow of DC. So the Joker doesn't really get punished, or at least not punished enough for what he's done. But in this case, he finally got what he deserved. The Jester. In the film Justice League Crisis on Two Earths, there is an alternate universe in which the Joker is a hero. And this is because the good guys are bad in this universe and the bad guys are good. Though in this universe, the Joker is actually called the Jester. And the film starts with Luther and the Jester stealing the technology they need to travel to other universes. The only problem is that the security on the place they're robbing is just too good. And so the two of them can't escape. So the Jester has no choice but to sacrifice his own life to hold off the bad guys and give Luther time to escape. This one will kill you. It won't be in vain, old friend. And he also managed to take out this universe's Martian Manhunter, who is of course a bad guy in this universe and one of the bigger crime bosses. So he did a double deed with his death. And it's refreshing to see a Joker death where he actually gives his life to save people and save the world. Because pretty much all the time he dies, he's doing something insanely evil and people are just trying to stop him. And the Jester really did save the world here because if Luther hadn't got to the alternate universe, then the evil Justice League would have ruled forever. But thanks to the Jester, the good version of the Justice League is able to travel to their universe and liberate the Jester's world. And I feel that his sacrifice is actually kind of overlooked in this film because it's right at the beginning and it's very quick so people move on to other moments. But him actually sacrificing his life is very important because none of what followed could have happened without him dying. So this Joker actually died saving his own world. Joker Gast In the show Batman the Brave and the Bold, the Joker falls to his death and with his nemesis gone, Batman ultimately decides it's time to retire. And so he passes the mantle of Batman onto Dick Grayson. Well, the mantle of Batman was passed, and justice endured. Batman endured. Now, years later, after Bruce Wayne has married Catwoman and had a son with her named Damian Wayne, the Joker's son attacks the Batman Museum and kills Bruce and Selina Wayne. <laughs> No! 
Batman later confronts him, only to discover that the Joker didn't actually die all those years ago, but has just been in hiding, though no one knows how he survived the fall. Oh, who cares? I've been blown up, dropped down smokestacks, fed to sharks. I'm the Joker! I always survive! But the Joker is now dying due to overexposure to chemicals, namely his Joker gas, and he decides to take Gotham down with him in one final hurrah and he is going to Joker gas everyone in Gotham City. Now, Batman and Robin are able to stop him, of course, but the gas was coming out of a Batman statue, and when it was destroyed, the head falls down, and it just misses hitting the Joker. But then a cannon of Joker gas is released straight into the Joker's face and the whole of his body. And it seems that this is too much for his chemical adult brain, and so he dies from the gas. <laughs> And the best thing about this death is that the Joker kills himself with the very Joker gas that he was going to destroy Gotham City with, which does give it a certain sense of poetic justice. Now, there are some who say that he didn't actually die here, and it is possible, but considering he is extremely old and crippled and is dying from overexposure to chemicals, well, this insane overdose would almost certainly have finished him off. Heck, it's enough Joker gas that it might actually kill a healthy person. But if he didn't die right in this second, then he would have died shortly after, because he only had six months to live anyway, and this Joker gas would have speeded up that timetable considerably. But personally, I think he died right then and there. Batman Beyond Return of the Joker In this film, the Joker is killed by the Tim Drake version of Robin. The Joker kidnaps Tim Drake and mind washes him into thinking he's the Joker's son. But thankfully, Robin is able to break free of the mind control, not completely, but just enough to kill the Joker. Now, there are two versions of this scene, one where Robin shoots the Joker, which is the one I mentioned in my other video, and a second, more PG version of his death, where the Joker trips and electrocutes himself with the same device that he used to torture Robin. The reason there's two of these death scenes is because the second one, which is more tame, was made for a second cut of the film, which would get a lower age rating. But even though he dies twice in this scene, it's still not the end of the Joker. Unbeknownst to everyone, the Joker had put a small chip into Tim Drake's body, which over the years copied both the Joker's mind and genetics over Tim Drake's mind and genetics. So basically, he turned Tim Drake into the Joker and let the Joker come back one last time. But he made a crucial mistake. The Joker pointed out this chip to Batman of the future while gloating about how good his plan was. And to be fair to the Joker, it is quite a clever plan, something which no one has ever been able to do, which is cheat death and get a second chance at life. The problem is, he is essentially saying, hey Batman, this is my weakness, hit me in this bit and I'll die. Which is exactly what happens, as Batman uses the Joker's own electric hand buzzer to fry the chip and kill the Joker once and for all. Which is why a supervillain should never start monologuing. Assault on Arkham Now, this film was supposedly linked to the Batman Arkham video games, and was meant to be a prequel to the game Batman Arkham Asylum. But as anyone who's seen this film knows, this is not true. This film is not connected to the games at all. I don't care what anyone says, this was all just a marketing ploy to make it look like a joint universe, because joint universes are popular and the PR people obviously wanted to cash in on that. But this is not linked to the game at all. And one of the main reasons we know that it's not linked is because the Joker features in all of the Arkham games. And yet he dies in this film, which as I said, is supposedly a prequel to these games. Now in the film, the Joker is fighting Deadshot and sadly for him, he loses. And Deadshot manages to stick him in place on a helicopter right before it falls off a skyscraper and explodes. And we watch as the Joker is killed, being caught in a huge explosion that even Batman couldn't have gotten out of. Live Action Batman In the classic Tim Burton's Batman film, Jack Nicholson plays the Joker, and after being defeated by Batman, he attempts to make his grand escape by grabbing onto a ladder from a helicopter. Unfortunately for the Joker, as he flies away, Batman fires a grapple after him that's attached to a gargoyle, and the extra weight causes the Joker to lose his grip and plummet to his death. Though the real question of this is whether Batman intended to kill the Joker or not. He may have just been trying to stop the Joker getting away, but this is one of the darker versions of the character, so it is possible he actually intended to kill him. 
Now, the story goes that originally the Joker wasn't going to die in this film, but the filmmakers decided that having him die would be more dramatic. And I must admit, I do think the ending is stronger for it. Though, of course, we all knew that the Joker would later return in live-action films. As I say, he is Batman's nemesis, and he's died a lot of times, but it's never stopped him from coming back, because he has the ultimate superpower, popularity. Injustice The Joker's death in Injustice is great for one reason. It's not Batman who finally snaps and kills him. For years, fans have been saying that Batman should kill the Joker, because he always escapes from wherever he is incarcerated, no matter what. Even in the Lego Batman, he was able to escape from the Phantom Zone and come back stronger than ever. And when he does come back, he kills more people and ruins more lives. And with each escape and stunt he has done, these stunts become larger and larger in this ever-building escalade of danger and damage that he has to create. But Batman has always refused to give in and break his moral code. No matter what the Joker does to him, he would never kill him. But when Joker sets off a nuke in Metropolis, killing 5 million people, which is undoubtedly the worst thing the Joker has ever done, Batman has control, though admittedly it is measured. The nuke. Where'd you get it? What? You want one? Copy that. But it's Superman who can't handle it. Everyone thinks Batman is the Dark One who interrogates in torturous ways. Please not stop! I'll tell you, just stop! Remember something else? And it's the one who's most likely to snap, as Superman is the Boy Scout goody two-shoes. But in this, we see that Batman is actually the more morally correct of the two, as he's been able to resist giving in killing the Joker for years. But if I do that, if I allow myself to go down into that place, I'll never come back. But Superman cannot deal with someone as insane and evil as the Joker and kills him in an instant. <laughs> now run along so I can break out of here. I've got lots of planning to do to top this. That's enough. I know it's soon, but think you'll ever love again? Maybe you won't kill your next family. And that's what makes this such a great death. The fact that it was Superman and not Batman who broke first and took a life. It's interesting to see that Batman, the only one of the main seven Justice League members who doesn't have any powers, is the one strong enough to resist killing the Joker, whereas Superman, the strongest and most powerful being on the planet, is not strong enough to stop himself. That being said, I do completely understand why Superman killed the Joker. He killed his wife and unborn child, and I don't honestly think any man worth a damn would be able to stop themselves from killing the Joker if that had happened to them. Not straight away when the pain and the loss was still fresh, which is why Superman shouldn't have been anywhere near the Joker at that point, but they couldn't exactly keep him away. As I said, he is the most powerful being on the planet. And killing the Joker is forgivable under those circumstances, at least in my mind, and I think that any jury would have let him go on a plea of temporary insanity. But it's everything the Superman does next that's wrong, and the Injustice games did prove that once a life is taken, it's a slippery slope to becoming a fully-fledged supervillain, which Superman definitely became in the Injustice 2 video game. I'll have a legion whose power rivals the combined Lantern Corps, and I want you to lead it with me. Never, Cal. You'll either make the right choice, or I'll make it for you. And this is actually one of the best things about the Injustice games. It does show why superheroes should never kill, even though we always say they should when we read the comics and watch the films. They have to have a line in the sand because once they cross it, they can't go back. MK11 In the Mortal Kombat games, once a player has beaten the opponent, they earn the chance to finish the opponent in an overly violent way by killing them in a unique little cutscene of gore. And since the Joker has been added as a DLC character on the game Mortal Kombat 11, the Joker can now be killed in a unique fatality by every single playable character in the game. And I decided to put these deaths in this video because they just look so awesome. And from a purely visual point of view, they might actually be the best deaths of the Joker that we have ever seen. Ah! 
true, there's no real story or emotional connection to his end, I know, which is a little disappointing, but this game gives us the most graphic and detailed demises of the jester of genocide that we have ever seen. So graphic, in fact, that I'm actually having to sense them a bit in this video, just to stop YouTube from age restricting this video. And that's all that needs to be said on this, because the quality and the violence of these deaths speaks for itself. And I've tried to pick the best ones to play here, but of course I don't have time to show all of them. In fact, if you actually put them back to back, it goes on for about 20 minutes. But they are all on YouTube if you do want to watch them properly. Sonya Blade calling in air support. Gotham. Now, I know some of you will be saying that this is not the Joker, but in truth, we all know that Jerome was the Joker. And the only reason that he was never called the Joker in the show is because the studio explicitly said they couldn't use the name because they were trying to save the Joker's character for the movies. But let's face it, we all know he's just a different version of the Joker's character. I mean, he's exactly the same, just with a bit of a different origin so they could tell a slightly different story. So I'm counting him as a Joker. And he actually dies twice in this show. The first time he is betrayed by an ally. You see, he was broken out of Arkham Asylum to cause mayhem in Gotham City so that Theo Galavan could stop him and look like a hero. And Jerome decided to go along with Galavan's plan just for kicks. But then Galavan decides to stab him in the neck and kill him. This is not what we rehearsed. I'm so sorry, Jerome. After all, Theo Galavan wanted to look like a hero, and killing him is a much more effective way of achieving this than just rescuing the hostages while the Joker escapes. And the thing I love most about this death is that, for once, it's the Joker who is betrayed and surprise killed, whereas normally it's the Joker who's doing the surprise murdering. And of course, no one watching this show saw it coming, because Jerome Joker was a fan favourite character, and we never thought the show would get rid of him. But of course, they didn't, because this is the DC Universe, so even though the Joker is dead, he's just brought back to life, in a Frankenstein-like experiment. Though when he wakes up, he finds that his face has been cut off by a Joker disciple who has tried to pretend to be him. But the Joker goes after him, gets his face back and staples it back onto his head, and tries to make the most of it. Of course, this doesn't last for long, and he does die again. Later on, he abducts a group of Gotham's rich and elite and holds them hostage at a concert with bombs around their necks. Jim Gordon, of course, rescues them and then he chases the Jerome Joker up onto a roof. He shoots him and then he falls backwards off of the roof. And he actually manages to cling to a pipe and Gordon tries to pull him up to save him. But he doesn't care if he dies as his legacy of lunacy will live on. And so he decides to fall to his death instead laughing like a maniac all the while, in true Joker fashion. <laughs> and both of these deaths are truly beautiful. I mean, the first one isn't exactly in the Joker style, but it is also quite good because it's not the Joker style, it's something different and unexpected. But the second one is pure Joker. I mean, sacrificing himself because he just doesn't care if he dies, because he knows he's famous enough that his legacy will live on, well, that's pretty much who the Joker is. And him laughing like this as he falls is just how the Joker would choose to end it. And though he did die twice on the show, the Joker does still live on, as he Joker gassed his twin brother with a special version of the gas that sent him permanently insane, and so his twin brother takes over the position of Gotham's Clown Prince of Crime and he then went on to terrorise Gotham for years. Mask of the Phantasm In Mask of the Phantasm, the Joker is portrayed as having been a goon for the mob, much different to his backstory in The Killing Joke. The Killing Joke is of course what's generally accepted to be his true origin. Now, in Mask of the Phantasm, he's done many, many bad things, but the one thing that finally got him killed was executing the lead female protagonist's father. You? But, but he paid you! Dad? Ah! After this happened, she hunted down all the members of the mob who were responsible for killing her father. That includes him and all the ones who gave the hit in the first place. The Joker was actually the last one she attacked and he was prepared for her. He had rigged his hideout with explosives and when Batman showed up as well, he ended up triggering the explosives. He was probably planning to escape at this point, but Andrea Beaumont, the woman whose father he had killed, grabbed a hold of him and the two were buried by the building and killed, with Joker laughing his mad laugh all the while. Yeah! 
and little did he know that he was actually robbing Batman of one of his greatest loves as well. Titans. Now the Joker actually dies twice in this show, sort of. The first occurs when Dick Grayson is trying to save Raven from her father, Trigon. But instead, Trigon uses his magic to trap him in a hallucination, where he returns to Gotham and finds Batman losing it. Batman is attacking villains way worse than usual and even kills the Joker by throwing him off of a building. Of course, since it's a hallucination, it's not a real death, but I still thought it deserved a mention. As for the real Joker death, I personally think they killed him a little too simply and without enough of a build up. It just kind of happens and it feels a bit out of nowhere to be completely honest. Basically, the Jason has killed Jason Todd and naturally everyone is distraught. Grayson returns to Gotham and he and Bruce have it out about how Bruce turns children into weapons and it's unfair and he wonders if Bruce even cared about Jason at all. And Bruce's response to this is to go to Arkham Asylum and beat the Joker to death with a crowbar. Do you know what he was doing as I caved in his skull? He was laughing. He laughed at me because he won. And it not only happens off screen, which is ridiculous because I think we'd all have loved to have watched the scene where Batman finally gives the Joker what he deserves, but it also makes no sense. Seriously, Bruce is holding it together reasonably well and then just disappears and returns with a crowbar saying he beat an insane mental patient to death. I mean, not only does it make no sense with Batman's character, I mean, Batman doesn't kill, that's kind of one of his things, but I really just can't believe that we didn't actually get to see it. I mean, who kills the Joker off screen? That's just boring. But this show does have a tendency to be a real downer and all the characters do actually act out of character all the time, just doing something dramatic and depressing just for shock value. I mean, I know they use the whole everyone's basically got depression as an excuse, but really it's just kind of bad writing. Which is a shame because I would actually love to say that this one made sense because Batman losing it over Jason's death and killing the Joker does actually make sense and it could be an amazing story. But honestly, I think they just handled it really badly because it just didn't seem very natural. It seemed forced. I mean, that may just be my opinion. If you disagree, please feel free to let me know in the comments. Telltale Batman. Now this version of Batman is a bit different to most versions. For starters, his parents were running a criminal empire in Gotham City and were killed by a rival mob boss. For the full story, check out the links in this video's description. And I really would check that one out because it's actually a pretty interesting story. And another huge difference is that the Joker and Bruce Wayne are actually friends. Well, sort of. They met when Bruce Wayne was drugged, so he'd act crazy, and then was put in Arkham Asylum and the Joker is his roommate, though no one knows who he actually is, so they just call him John Doe. And although he's a bit nuts, he's actually more kind of quirky and likeable. Well, he is actually still quite violent, but still he is actually oddly likeable. Now, as the game series goes on, they both get out of Arkham and do sort of become friends, depending on the player's choices. This is a multi-path game after all, so you get to decide what happens. And one set of choices leads to the Joker becoming a vigilante hero and trying to be like Batman. And the other set of choices leads to the Joker hating Bruce Wayne and becoming the evil Joker that we all know and love. And when Bruce Wayne and Joker fight, Bruce Wayne wins but loses his temper and keeps hitting the Joker again and again and again until he beats him to death. Though unfortunately this death doesn't actually last for very long as Bruce uses his bat gadgets as a makeshift defibrillator and restarts the Joker's heart, bringing him back to life. Now, I know this is actually the weakest death on this list, and I did actually debate keeping it out and just doing four deaths, but I'm used to doing five of each video, and to be fair, this does still count as a death. He may not have been dead for long, sure, but he did still technically die. After all, you can't restart someone's heart without them first of all being dead. And considering the fact that he would have stayed dead if Bruce had done nothing, well, I think it counts. Although you can choose not to restart the Joker's heart and let him die. Though sadly, this does end up giving you a game over and you just have to go back and if you want to progress in the game, you have to save him. But still, you can choose to let him die for real if you want. And lastly, in Justice League Dark Apocalypse War, it's mentioned that Batman killed the Joker. But we don't really see anything or get any of the details. It's just kind of mentioned in passing. A week after that, my pudding died thanks to new Batman. Always no fun, by the way. 
which is why I'm only mentioning it in passing now. Since we didn't get any details or visuals of the death, I'm not really counting it, but I did think it was worth mentioning. And finally, there's one more death that deserves a mention, even though it was technically faked. In the Batman vs Dracula film, the Joker is fighting Batman, and after trying to stab Batman, he ends up hanging over a steep drop. Batman of course tries to save his life, as I've said before, he does this a lot. But the Joker tries to electrocute Batman instead, and take him over the drop with him so they can die together. And because of this, the Joker is unable to get up and falls into a body of water, and his electric joy buzzer goes crazy, frying him alive. And Batman thinks that he is dead. Though, of course, he wasn't, and in fact later returns as a vampire. And I mention this because even though the death was faked, he does still kind of die, as vampires are the undead. So not quite dead, but pretty much a corpse that's somehow still moving. And though it's not a proper death, I still thought it deserved a mention. And this is actually the only time in animation that the Joker has become a vampire. And I think it's an idea that really needs to be used again. I mean, could you imagine a Batman Arkham video game with a vampire Joker? Because I think that would be absolutely amazing to play. Although I'd also think it was amazing if we could play a vampire version of Batman, but hey, maybe we'd get both. Or better yet, Vampire Batman, Werewolf Joker. <laughs>